All right, we're going to go ahead and go. We may have a few other people coming in. But you might have realized as you've already gone to a couple of sessions that we have 15 minutes, <laughs> which is quite a challenge. I think so. Um, because we've got a lot to cover with note taking, as you can imagine. So we're, if this is going to be really, we're going to zip through at a faster pace than we ever would if we really wanted you to totally understand this, but we want to try to cover the, the scope of it and give you an idea of it. And then if you have questions, you can email or um, see us later. So we, in our 15 minutes, we've divided up into kind of five, three five minute segments where we're going to explain to you the Cornell notes in general in the first five minutes, and then we're going to kind of have you participate in using it, and then we're going to give you one to do on your own for the last five minutes to see if you have if that generates some questions about how it really works. Um, so um, we did put the definition of strategy on our presentation because we weren't sure that you were actually anyone had given you a definition of a strategy, although you're going to strategies all night long. So we thought this might just be helpful. So a strategy is an approach to a learning task that serves as a clever system to help students do something better, faster, or more easily. So every strategy that they're learning is for one of those purposes. Um, so we're just going to go over very quickly some more typical note-taking uh, methods that you probably already know. There's nothing wrong with these, but we're going to try to sh tell you why Cornell notes are so much better. <laughs> but outlining is a very standard way of taking notes. It gives the student gets the main idea, the supporting information, important details, and it's very organized. And for a lot of kids, that kind of organization is very helpful. Um, if you keep that in mind, when we get to the Cornell notes, we're going to show you how much more the Cornell notes do in terms of understanding the material because this is pretty much just recognizing some specific information in something that you're reading and putting it down and it kind of stops there. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's kind of the general outline format. We have discovered that a lot of our kids don't know the format for outlining. That it's Roman mm -hmm. numerals and then you know the capital A, B's and C's and the indentions. So we do teach that and a lot of classes use outlining for certain assignments but the older the kids get in the grade levels by 11th and 12th grade, we're doing heavily Cornell notes because it is an excellent way to take notes in college. And so we're trying to kind of get them real used to using that. And it's also really adaptable to any kind of class you have or any kind of subject you're taking. Um, framing is another um, strategy that is on our list, on Novo Academy's list of strategies <coughs> that we teach the kids and want them to know. As you notice, it's very similar to the outline but it's a more graphic organizer type outline. And so for a lot of kids, that works better than the very um, ordered lines. But for other kids, the line, you know, the ordered ABC, one, two, three works better. So it's still, um, you, the framing, you put what your topic is about, and then however many main ideas you have, you're going to have columns of main ideas, and then your essential details. Again, this is very effective in pulling out some important pieces of information from something you're reading, but it stops there. So it's a good start. It's a good way to gather up the information, but you don't do much else with it than pick out the main ideas and the, the essential details that are under each one. But it's a good strategy. <coughs> um, so this is the Cornell Note strategy, and this is the first page on your handout. We wanted you to be able to take some of this home, especially if you're interested in working with your student. Um, it would be helpful for you to have this because if you're like us, you can sit here and listen to this, but next week when you want to try to use Cornell notes for your student, you're, you may not remember any, you know, how to do it. So, um, Cornell notes basically is a T graph, um, and the kids who know this just know how to draw it in their notebooks. Um, the, you see the number one section is the biggest section, and you do it first. The reason it says number one is because you cover that first. So the general notes are there, and the key thing to this is you do this section as you read. Whether you're reading a short story, whether it's a history chapter, whether it's a science chapter, as you're reading, you're jotting down things that you think are important. Um, generally, it's supposed to be in phrases, not sentences, but we have a really hard time getting some kids not to write complete sentences because we harp on that so much for the writing. So that's okay, but it's easier if they just put phrases. And the general notes are just any important details like names or dates or places, numbers, list. You know, key information is they read factual statements, any explanations or reasons for what they're reading. And this would apply to any subject matter that they're doing as they read. 
And we probably should have also added, or during the lecture, because yes. they can use this exact exactly. same format during a lecture class. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They just take general notes in the main <coughs> section here and ignore this and this. This is just like they would normally take notes. So if they have their own little shorthand method or anything like that. Um, so what this does is get the important information, like the main ideas that they were putting in the other in the outline. But in addition to that, either as soon as you finish this, sometimes teachers will say, now look over your general notes and pull out the main concepts, or they might have read something in class or lectured something in class, and for homework, it's fill out the column that's the main concepts. So what they're doing is looking over everything that they have here and trying to <coughs> pinpoint what the key general concepts of whatever they read are. Moving from all of the general information to, okay, in this article, what are the four most important concepts that it's talking about? And they... And then they list their key concepts here. So the main concepts would be the key topics that they see covered over here. The general ideas. What what is all this talking about? <laughs> they put that over here. What? <laughs> all the, no way. Go away. Um, this is created from the general notes after reading or the lecture is completed. Either immediately after or that night or even two days later if you're going to go back and revisit it. One of the things we like about the Cornell notes is you're looking at the material three times. You're, you're, you're taking the notes, then you're trying to analyze what the main ideas are. And then the third um, section, which is at the bottom, you can also do right after that or go back later, is where you try to summarize this in a couple of sentences. Um, it's a great, we are actually teaching three completely different skills with this. Picking out important details, analyzing material and determining what's important, and summarizing material. And there is no other note system in and of itself that does all three of those. So by the time you've done all that, you are you really have a better grasp of the material than if you just wrote down, you know, key terms or whatever was bolded in the history <laughs> book. You wrote that down. You don't really have to do anything else with that. All right, that was a little over five minutes. Okay, so um, if you'll turn, what we want you to do is try one. Um, so if you'll turn your page, um, like the sign. Um, is an example of one that's for English. Um, so that just shows you, I'm not going to go over that because we're already into our second five minute session and this was in the first five minutes, but that's just an example for you to take home of how you would do a short story. This, the next one is an example of how you would do a chapter in biology so that you can kind of see what actually, what things actually go into those sections. Um, and I'm sorry, we're just zipping past that, but we wanted you to see an example in two different subjects to see how it works across the board. Um, and then the third one is actually, um, for, how many of you have ninth grade students? Okay, um, the, 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 this third one, the energy resources, um, is a little bit different than the Cornell Notes, but it's kind of the beginning of the Cornell, Cornell Note um, concept, and it's in the, the ninth grade science book. Earth science, um, Earth science work. So they're already being introduced mm -hmm. to Cornell in kind of a simplified version. So that by the time they get to us, you know, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, it shouldn't look so alien to them. It's just they're doing more on their own once we get there. Yeah. Okay, so if you'll turn to what is the difference between partly cloudy and partly sunny? Mm -hmm. And we're going to zip through this. <laughs> so just stay with me. Normally, I promise you, I'll teach this fast. <laughs> there are official government... Um, so, oh, so we're going to take the notes as I read. So if you think I've just said something that should be on the notes, read it again. There are official government rules for weather forecasting. If 40 to 70 percent of the sky is expected to be cloudy, the forecast is partly cloudy. If the clouds are... What? Okay, good. Because we should be taking notes by now. So I'm glad somebody raised their hand. And it went off. Go on. Come back. Okay. So, um, so we put... 40 to 70 percent, pretend like this isn't done yet, but we put 40 to 70 percent chance for clouds means it's partly cloudy. 
partly cloudy. That's what they would say, partly cloudy. If the clouds are less than 40%, the forecast is partly sunny. So we just write less than 40, partly sunny. Uh, when there are no clouds in the forecast, forecast it's called clear. While if more than 70% cloud cover is expected, it's called cloudy. So we have, you know, we have all of that kind of data as we're reading written down. Some forecasters do not use the word partly at all, but, but prefer to use mostly because they feel it's a more accurate description. Well, I thought that was important. So I put mostly, more accurate than partly. Can I ask a question? Why would you not say at the beginning, there are official rules for, you know, government rules for forecasting? Well, you might, but the forecasting rules is a concept, and what you're trying to put here is the details. But you could, yeah. and there, it's also it's, there's nothing it's, wrong. That would make sense. Yeah, yeah. there's yeah. nothing wrong that yeah. if you put forecasting rules over here, and then when you look at it and realize that's a concept, you add it over here. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. It doesn't it, like it's not wrong if you put a concept over here. Mm -hmm. But you're trying to go for the details and the factual information here, and then try to put that all together as concepts over here. Okay. So these are actually the set of rules. Okay. So these are the details of the that's rule, the heading and that's but the, the rules are the concept. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, unfortunately, not all weather forecasters stick to the rules. Meteorologists tend to be somewhat opinionated. They all believe they can forecast the weather better than their fellow meteorologists. And if you read on through, it kind of talks about the whelms of the individual forecasters and what mood they're in. If they if they got in bad traffic, then they're going to say partly cloudy instead of partly sunny because they're in a bad mood. I, I thought that was very interesting. So we got we're not we don't have time unfortunately to go through that but I listed those things um, about how it's kind of the moods um, and that if you had five different um, meteorologists there'd be five different forecasts and then you you see how you go from this to saying okay the three main points here are the there are forecasting rules there's some forecasting terminology like mostly partly. Mm -hmm. And there's personal and personality influences in the weather forecast. Those are the three main concepts of that article. So then I would summarize it. Forecasting the weather depends greatly on the choice of terminology, the attitude of the forecaster, him or herself, and the degree to which the forecaster follows the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Do everybody see how that works? Then you've really mm -hmm. analyzed the article, not just gotten the information. Okay, in the little time we have left, we want you to read the last article, skim it really quickly, just skim the first two paragraphs, yeah. and you on, the, on the page behind that you have a little blank thing, and just jot down some things as you're reading just the first paragraph or two. Actually, we didn't bring <laughs> I'll um, take it. Okay, you can take it. But just um, pretend like this was your assignment to do notes on that second article, which is what is the correct way to eat an Oreo cookie. We're not taking these up. We're not grading them. Just <laughs> we just want you to get a sense of. And then we've done we have done one for you, to, and we're going to show that right before we're over to see you know how you how close you were to the way we do it. We are running short on time. Why don't you go ahead and stop reading, review your notes, and see if you can come up with the key concepts, the key words over in the right hand column of what you have written so far. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. 
I'm thinking about that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 6.30 and time for session four. All right, but we're going to stay just another minute because we want to see day. how you did. <laughs> All right, so if I had asked the students to read through this, what I would hope that they picked up from the first two paragraphs were the different ways to eat an Oreo, that they would list, you can eat it all at once, that you can nibble on it, dunk it, separate it, or share it. And then when Oreos were invented and the flavors that they could originally get the Oreos in. When they took it home and then tried to figure out what the key words were, I hope they could figure out that these were ways to eat Oreos. And this section right here is talking about the invention of Oreos. And then the next part of the assignment would be to summarize this. And I summarized it with the way people eat Oreos depends on their preference. Some of the ways include nibbling, dunking, separating, sharing, and all at once. <laughs> so the benefit of the Cornell notes, just quickly before you guys leave, is they can take all their notes like they normally would during class, and then they have to do something with the notes afterwards. So they have to reread them and then write the main concepts or keywords on the side, and then we have to figure out how do I summarize this in just a few sentences at the bottom. So hopefully you guys will take these home and Cornell notes will make more sense as you see some of these coming home with your students. And feel free to email us or stop by and talk to us. We know that.